All right, we're ready for Judges chapters 10 and 11. Judges 10 and 11. Let's go to our questions first. Get two or three questions out of the way, and then we'll get underway with reviewing where we've been and where we're going. Question one, a short summary of chapter 10. What's chapter 10 about? All right. Tola and J.R. and Amorite oppression. Question two, a short summary of chapter 11. What's it about? What else? <laughs> I'm sorry. Jephthah. Yes, Jephthah. And one more question, and then we'll come back to our questions later. What judge or judges are found in this week's lesson? All right. Very good. Those three, Tola, Jair, and Jephthah. All right, here's where we've been, and here's where we're going. This is our outline. We have followed apathy, apostasy, and anarchy, and we're still in the apostasy section that deals with the various judges and we're right here in starting into chapter 10, which goes on into chapter, the next section. And so we're going to look at three judges uh, within that section. This is the cycle we've been focusing upon each time, and we see the cycle go again. Though the cycle is not identified in every, with every judge. It's implied, but not in every judge is the cycle specifically stated. But again, I remind you of the cycle that Israel falls into sin, and then there is an oppressing nation that comes. They cry out to the Lord. We see all of that in tonight's lesson. God raises up a judge. They're delivered. And then they serve the Lord for a while. And then they go back into the cycle again. And uh, this is the outline I've shared with you several times from Micah. The need for the judges. The work of the judges is where we are. Now, these are the judges we've covered so far, at least by the time we get through with our study. Uh, tonight, we've seen these judges. And I've encouraged you to try to keep these in memory. And so we've started with Othniel, Ehud, Shemgar, Deborah. Some put Barak there. Uh, Gideon, Abimelech. That's so far what we've covered. And tonight we're looking at the next three. Tola, Jair, and Jephthah. All right, let's go to chapter 10 now. And let's start with question four before we go to the outline. What are some things we know about Tola? I'm sorry, who said that? Okay, he's from Issachar. Very good. All right. So we know where he dwelt, where he lived. Uh, Shemar, and judged for 23 years. What else do we know? Did he, did, was he a judge or not? All right. Good point. Verse, uh, verses one and two tell us all we really know about Tola, which isn't a lot. Uh, but we know he defended Israel, uh, must have against whom we're not told. We're not told about an oppressing, uh, nation here or which nation it was. But after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, um, after, after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, uh, man of Issachar, dwelt in Shemar, and he judged Israel, which we've mentioned judge, the judge was the idea of um, a military deliverer, so he did deliver them, or at least led them in, in some deliverance, implied, but what, against what nation, it's not ever specified. So we don't know a great deal about him, but we know a few things. So he is seemingly one of the, or he is one of the judges. He's called a judge and judged 23 years. Uh, then after him, there was Jair. Question number five, what do we know about him? All right, he judged 22 years. He was from Gilead. Anything else? All right. Uh, was quite a prominent man, we take it. 
uh, by having, and must have had multiple wives because, uh, we don't know that for sure, but must have by having 30 sons, uh, and they had 30 towns named after them, uh, Havoth Jair, which simply meant towns of Jair. So here's the towns, and that suggests something of his power and his influence, and so he's a very influential man. Um, and he seems to be the first judge from the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, so that's a little bit we know about him, and I've got verses 3 to 18 designated for that, but uh, uh, really that he um, doesn't go all the way through that section. We have the Ammonite oppression following that. So uh, we have those two judges that are mentioned there, Tola and Jair, and now we're ready for the Ammonite oppression. Now let's talk about that section, verses 6 to 18, and we'll come back to uh, Jephthah and answer some questions about him and do some practical things toward the end of our study. So starting at verse 6 now, we have the Ammonite oppression. Uh, let's take a moment, and well, let's come back to that. I'm going to go to a map in just a moment, uh, because they're not introduced just yet, but they, we'll see them in just a moment. Starting at verse 6, uh, verse 6 says that the children of Israel again did evil. That's interesting. They again, that's, that implies this cycle again. Uh, we're going back through the cycle. Here we go again. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served various gods. Uh, I don't know the great deal of importance to dissect every god. Each god had a different um, emphasis and importance to those uh, of the pagans. But they served the Baals and the Ashtaroths. Uh, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So what's interesting to me is they, two or three things are implied here. One is that they again go in the cycle. They didn't learn their lesson. They've, they've gone through the cycle, and, and God's going to remind them, I've delivered you, and I've delivered you, and I've delivered you, and I'm tired of delivering you. But here we go again. They go back into sin. Secondly, what's implied is it not, it wasn't just one God that they drew toward, such as, let's just take one, for example, the Baals, uh, that they, they went after the certain Baals, but they didn't go after the other gods. They were just not interested, but there was something drawing about that God. But they went after this God, which is different from that God, which is different from this God, which is different from that God, which is different from this other God, and they went after all of those. I don't know that that implies that this person was serving all of those gods, but some were serving this god, and some were serving that god, and some were serving that god, depending on uh, the nation that may have been of an influence upon them. Now, we, we've seen this point several times, and I know I'm camping a little long at verse 6, but let's go back, at least in principle, if you don't want to turn back there, let's go back to chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Judges, and the point being introduced to us in chapters 1 and 2 was this. That they have a job, you've, you've settled in the land, you've got into your, your, your tribes, you've got your territory now, but there's pockets of people, I know I'm paraphrasing, that's not the wording here, there are pockets of people in each one of your tribes you need to drive out. And over and over again, through chapters 1 and 2, what statement do we see? They didn't drive them out. They didn't drive them out. Look at chapter 1 and at verse Starting at verse 27, if you're reading from the New King James, which gives chapter headings, or at least section headings, I know supplied by translators, but here's incomplete conquest of the land. They didn't finish the job. They didn't drive them out. Now let's go back to chapter 10 and in verse 6. Here's the consequence of that. The consequence of that is they've got the influence of all these people around them, and they're being influenced by all of these gods. And here's the result of that. And at the end of verse 6, not only did they go after these gods, but they obviously had to do this in order to serve those gods. They forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Turned their back on God and did whatever they wanted to do. And the text said in chapter 2, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Or chapter, uh, the end of the book said that. All right, let's go to 7 through 9. God delivered them into the hands of Ammon. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. We're going to see two reactions of the Lord. We'll draw attention to this later, um, much later. But just note at verse six, verse 7, rather, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So what did God do? All right, sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of Ammon. 
Now, the Philistines introduced to us here, but if it wasn't for verse uh, 7, you read through the rest of 10 and all through 12, and you don't see anything about the Philistines, do you? Except for that verse 6, it mentioned the God of Philistines. The focus is on Ammon and not the Philistines, but the Philistines are introduced. One writer suggests that that verse is introducing to us not just the judgeship of, of Jephthah, but is introducing to us the judgeship of, of Samson, which we're going to see starting at chapter 13. The Philistines were the problem at that period. Make sense? So God delivered them into the hand. Doesn't mean that the Philistines were the, the predominant force right now. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with a little bit later in the next uh, few chapters. But God delivered them because of this into the hands of the Philistines and Ammon. But now the focus is on Ammon. Make sense? So we're going to forget the Philistines till we get to chapter 13. We were introduced to them, but that's it. So here is where Ammon is from. To give you kind of your bearing, this is the, the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea and the Jordan River, Gilead. This is the land of Canaan, the, the, uh, not on the map, but just beyond where the map cuts off would be the Sea of Galilee. Well, here's the region of Ammon. This is where the nation of Ammon w- would be. So God delivered them into the hands. In fact, the wording is at verse 7. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. What does that suggest to you? Yeah. It's almost slavery. And it's the idea God didn't literally sell them and God take money. But it's like the idea of slavery that I, I'm done with these slaves. They're worthless. I want to sell them to you because they're not doing any good to me and, and you can have them. And so uh, he let, in other words, he let uh, Ammon do what they wanted to do. Now, verse 8, how long were they under the oppression of Ammon? 18 years. Make a note of that to the side um, because we, we sometimes want to come back through here. How long were they under this oppression? How long did this man judge? I'm trying to make note of those myself. As we go along, 18 years of oppression. Um, and all the children of Israel on the other side of the Jordan, on the land of, of the Amorites uh, in Gilead. So what I'm learning from verse 7 is primarily this oppression was on this side of the Jordan River. That is on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, was there anything to go on the other side? Yes. Who said that? Ricky, why do you say that? Because it says so. <laughs> Yes, uh, verse 9, good answer. Uh, that more of the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and Ephraim. And here's a key phrase here, that, that so that Israel was severely distressed. Things are getting bad. They've gone into sin. God's going to let them sink to a low before they ever cry out to God. So we're going to make more of that a little bit later. They've gone into sin. They've sunk low. For 18 years they've been serving, and finally they, the, uh, the enemy, the oppressing nation, drives across and comes over here and affects some other tribes. But primarily three tribes on the east side of Jordan is where their, their oppression really is. But they come across and influence on the other side as well. So, now let's go a little bit further. Now that gets us through verse 9. Let's go back to our outline and... Verse 10 through 18 to finish the chapter, this is where the children of Israel cry out for deliverance. So we have the oppression, and it's severe. Now, what happens beginning at verse 10? I mean, more specifically, I know they cry out. Don't tell me that. I already told you that. (laughs) Uh, Specifically, what happens here? All right, they finally reach the low so severely de- uh, distressed that they said, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and served Baals. Come to recognize we indeed have sinned. So what was the Lord's answer to that? Now this is interesting. All right. Absolutely. Before he does that, that's, that's a good point. Before he does that though, what does he say? Absolutely. This is not the first time I've done this. I've delivered you time and time and time. It would be like somebody greatly in debt and you're generous enough to bail them out of that debt and they 
they go back into debt and you bail them out again, and they go back into debt and you bail them out again, and you go back into debt and you bail them out again, they go back into debt and you bail them out again, they go back in and you get the picture, and then finally you may reach the point, you know what, I helped you here, I helped you there, I helped you there, I helped you there, I helped you there, and you can forget it. Got done with them. Let's see that picture here. Uh, I delivered you from Egypt, from the Amorites, and from the Ammonites, and the Philistines, and the Sidonians, and the Amalekites, and the uh, Ma- Maonites, and um, you might take a footnote, a look at that. That's the Midianites. If you're reading from the New King James, it says Maonites. That's the same as the Midianites. I delivered you from them, and I delivered you from their hand, and yet you've forsaken me, servant of the uh, other gods. Therefore, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. God, God sometimes reaches the point, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. Uh, why is God done with them? You say they sinned, but they have sinned before and he didn't say that. What's the difference seemingly this time? All right. That's, that's a good point. What else? Very good. I'm not fishing for one specific answer. Good point. I think all, all the answers here we are correct. It seems to, and I wasn't looking for a specific answer. There's more of a thought question that it seems that, that they have reached a point of total rebellion. Not just that they've gone into sin and, okay, we realize we've done wrong, we're, we're turning back. Uh, and, okay, we did again and we turned back. But this seemed to be total rebellion when they had served the gods. Notice the gods that are mentioned at verse 6. That's one reason I spent some time on that. This god and that god and this god and that god and this god and this god and that god over there. They went after every one of them. And so God finally reaches the point, I'm done with you, I've delivered you. Now, what Stephen said just a moment ago is interesting for us to consider. Look at verse 14. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen and let them deliver you in the time of your distress. If you're in trouble, you like those gods, see if they'll save you. You, you, you like the God of verse verse 6. You like the God of the Moabs. Go to the God of Moabs and see and cry to him. See if he'll help you. You like the Baals, go after the Baals. You like the Asterisks, go after them and that, see if they'll help you. What a rebuke that is. You like them, those gods, go serve them. See what they'll do. I'm done. I'm not, I'm, I'm done with you. Now what did the people do? Beginning at verse 15. Good point. Do, do you see, and maybe I'm making a distinction that's not there. Is there a difference in verse 10 when they said we have sinned and forsaken God, and when we come to verse 15, well, we have sinned and thus do whatever seems best to us? Is there a difference? Yes, a spirit of submission, which may not be there. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just wondering if there's a difference in verse 10 and in verse 15. Maybe maybe I'm seeing a distinction that's not there. Because if they have this deep contrition back at verse 10 and God's still saying, I'm done with you. I'm wondering if, if that's not suggesting that they're, they're, they've, they've had a greater change of heart. It's one thing for, let's just picture a drunkard in the church. Let's say, suppose somebody's a drunkard. They just keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking. And the elders go talk to him and he says, I've sinned, I've sinned. That's one thing, but it's a different thing in saying I've sinned and giving up your sin and quitting and trying to get right. Big difference, isn't it? Now I'm wondering if they're just acknowledging, okay, we've done wrong, but when God says I'm done with you, now they're ready to say, well then we're willing to submit, to what, do with us what you want. Whatever you need to do, but we have sinned. And they did more than that, verse 16. What else did they do? All right, they put the gods away. Here's a description of repentance. Repentance involves an acknowledgement and an admission. I've done wrong, 
verse, verse 15. And then it also involves putting away the sin from among us. And then beyond that, turning and serving God. Let's go back to the drunkard. He needs to acknowledge his sin. He needs to put his drinking away. But that's not enough. He can quit drinking and not be right. He needs to turn to the Lord. Now, is there a change in God's attitude? Verse 16. Good point. Good point. Look at that phrase. Here's a statement of God's mercy. His soul can no longer endure the misery of Israel. I'm not getting the picture God's fickle and that God said, okay, I'm done with you. Okay, I can't do that. But it seems to me, and I'm trying to paint a picture, and maybe I'm painting a picture that's not there, that they acknowledge their sin, yes, at verse 10, but God's not seeing the change of heart like he does at verse 15. And after God said, I'm done with you, they have a change of heart, they put away their idols, and God's mercy then kicks in. Make sense? Yes, and it's about to get tough. It's about to get tough. Then, verse 17 uh, says, um, they've, they've cried out for deliverance. Deliverance hadn't come, but God has mercy on them. I want you to see his mercy. Now, verse 17 and 18, to finish that chapter, then the people of Ammon gathered together and camped in Gilead, that's on the east side of the Jordan River, and the children of Israel assembled together and encamped at Mizpah. And the people and the leaders of Gilead said to one another, who is the man that's going to begin to fight for us and be head over the inhabitants of Gilead? All right, let's go to the map just for a moment, and then we're ready to leave that chapter and work through the next. Um, so, uh, Gilead is, is right here in this, this region right here. Uh, between the Arnon River and the Jabbok River, Gilead is right here close to the people of Ammon. They used to occupy that, and we'll see more about that in the next chapter. Uh, so they've, they've, they've camped and get ready for battle because they are the oppressing nation, and they are at Mizpah. I think I have Mizpah right here on. Yes, Mizpah is right here. Uh, you see the region of Ammon uh, right here, and then here is the city of Mizpah. That's where the battle is ready to take place. Now, they're, they're leaderless, uh, according to the end of chapter 10, and that brings us to chapter uh, 11. Let's go to our questions once more before we go to chapter 11. Um, let's go to question number six. List some things you know about Jephthah. All right. Those are all true. What else? Hated by his brothers and expelled and ran out of the region. All right, we'll come back to the next question in a moment, but let's start working through chapter 11. Uh, verse 1, Jephthah of Gilead. He is from that side of the Jordan River, the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, he was from the region. He was a mighty man of valor. He had established himself as a mighty man. Had that name and that reputation, I gather, before he was even expelled by his brothers, so that when they're looking for a leader, they remember Jephthah, as the text seems to imply. So let's get verses 1 through 3, him being expelled. He was introduced to us as a man of, of Gilead. Uh, he was the son of a harlot. Uh, and he, um, he was a mighty man of valor. Verse 2 and 3, what do I see? What happens here? All right, he's driven out. His, his, his uh, Gilead's wife bore sons, the text says, and when they grew up, they drove him away from their father's house and from the inheritance. Uh, a child of a harlot did not have the same inheritance among the legitimate children, and so they drove him out. They were not going to share their inheritance. You have no inheritance in our father's house. So he fled and went to the land of Tob. That would have been to the north. So if you, uh, I'm not at the map now. We'll come to, we'll see. Uh, that region in a moment, but he just went north, kind of north uh, east as he took off, and he's gone. Now, verse 3 says that he dwelt in the land of Tob and worthless men, vain men, in other words, men who didn't have anything to do and looking for something to, to be involved in, seemingly. I'm not sure it means they were totally worthless and, and not helpful. And they banded together with Jephthah, and they went out raiding, the new King James says, with him. 
Uh, I meant to check. Anybody have the English standard on that? What did it say he did, they, these worthless men did? Who has ESV? Same thing. I'm sorry. Went out with him. Rating is supplied by the translators. I don't take it that they went out as vicious men. Some suggest what that means is they were looking to get involved in something. And uh, some have even suggested maybe they're going out and just looking for work, looking what they can what they can do. Others think that, and and seems to maybe be implied of how he got his name, uh, being a man of valor, is they might have gone out not as just raiding anywhere, but maybe fighting off some of the enemies of and been successful to some degree, and, and at least demonstrated he's a leader. Uh, so if you can imagine looking for a military leader, you wouldn't just pick any person. You want somebody who knows a little something of what they're doing. And so he may have had some experience of, of getting a following and he'd gone out on some, some, uh, and maybe it's implied that it was a raid. Uh, but that's verses one through three. He's off doing that after he's been expelled. Well, now the men of Gilead go back and seek for him to head up a fight against Ammon. This is, this is most interesting here. It came to pass after the time the people of Ammon made war against Israel and as the people of Ammon made war, verse five, the elders went to get Jephthah in the land of Tom. Now, why did they go? Well, the text doesn't say. I think they, I mean, why did they go for him and not just find somebody in their region? I think it's because he has established himself as a man of valor. Does that make sense? He's established himself as a leader and perhaps had this reputation of going out and fighting against others and being successful. And so Jephthah said, what did he say to them? Verse 7. Yeah, I thought y'all didn't have any use for me. I thought you hated me, and I was expelled from my father's house, and now you come for me when you're in distress. I almost see a parallel when and when when the children of Israel went to God in time of distress, when they had done they're done with God, uh, but they come back crawling to God. We need your help. Uh, they got rid of of Jephthah. They didn't want to have any use for him, and now they come crawling back to him. We need you now. And now what happens? Verse eight and nine and ten, eleven. That's why, verse 8, they, they said to Jephthah, that is why, that is, I'm taking the distress, that is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head. In other words, we not only want you to be our warrior and our military general, we want you to come back and be our leader of Gilead. That's what we want you to do. So what did Jephthah say? Yeah, that's a valid question because human nature often is people will let you do the dirty work for them and then they're done with you. That happens a lot of times. We need somebody to come in and do our fighting. We need somebody to do our dirty work. We need somebody to, to clean up the mess. And when you do all of that, then they're done with you. They don't have any use for you anymore. Um, there, there have been a number of people who had no use for gospel preachers who, who refuted error. They didn't like that. They liked soft preaching. They didn't like men who refuted error who are known for doing that. But when they get in a bind and get in trouble, guess who they call for when they need to have a debate with a denominational guy? They call those guys that knew how to deal with error. And then when they deal with error, you know what? They're done with them. They don't have them back for meetings. They don't have, they don't have no use for them. But they come and did the dirty work for them, and then they're, they're done. Well, that's why he asked that kind of question. That's human nature, I think. So they said, yes, you, and I'm paraphrasing 10, 11, because I want to get to something else. You come on back with us, and we're going to make you head. And this agreement was made in the presence of the Lord. Now, verse 12 to 28, now we have Jephthah and the king of Ammon have a dispute. What stands out in your mind other than the fact they have a dispute? It wasn't just, what's your problem with us? Uh, why are you fighting with us? But what does stands out in your mind different about this discussion or dialogue that we haven't seen so far in Judges? At least in this detail. Jephthah. We tried to make peace with them. Yeah, what have you got against us? Why are you doing this? He does more of reviewing the details of history. 
What's interesting about that history is always helpful in any battle, is it not? Knowing what really happened. Because what's going on in our society uh, is we're trying to erase a lot of history. We go back and try to erase the history because as if it didn't happen. And we do that sometimes in religion. We forget what really happened back here. We forgot the history of that. Uh, Jephthah reminds them, this is what really happened. You've got the thing all wrong here. Your version of history doesn't fit true history. And we'll see how that happens here. Let's, let's start working through this. Beginning at verse 13 now. Uh, verse 12, rather. He said, Why, what do you have against me? This is interesting at verse 12 because he ends on this note a little bit later. What do you have against me that you've come out to fight against me? I want to know what the, the issue is. What have we done to you that you are ready to fight against Israel? Tell me what the problem is. And the king of Ammon answered and said, what? You took our land away. In other words, this land over here, this is the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. This land right over here where Gad, we have Reuben and Gad and half a tribe of Manasseh. This land right in here, this region right here, you stole from us and you took it away from us. That battle's still going on in Israel. Uh, who owns the land and who has a right to the land? Uh, that's another issue. But nonetheless, look at verse 13. He talked about from Arnon to the, to, uh, as the Jabbok River to the Jordan, uh, now restore that land to us. What he's talking about, here's the Arnon right down here. This is the, right here, the, the Salt Sea and the Jabbok. So in other words, this whole region right here, you stole that from us. You took that from us, now give it back, and we won't fight you anymore. That's what we want. We want our land back. Restore it to us peacefully. So Japheth sent messengers, and what did he say now, beginning at verse 15? Yeah, everywhere we went, we were rejected. So basically, he methodically works through history. So let's work through that history quickly. Look at verse 15. You might underline. Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. We never took it, but took it away from them. We never stole it from them. That's not what happened. Let me back up a little bit. I'm paraphrasing as if Jephthah is the one speaking. Let me back up and tell you that when we came to the king of Edom, look at, you might underline Edom, and then Moab at verse 17, we asked permission to pass, and with both nations... We wouldn't let them. So then, we sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites. And we said, please let us pass through, verse 20. And But Sihon did not trust for us to pass through. And he gathered against us and encamped in J, uh, Jahaz and fought against Israel. So there was a different situation. We came to these other nations and we went around them. They didn't try to fight us. But when we came to Sihon, he was the one who started the fight. We asked if we could come through and he said no. And he started the fight. Now he makes five points here. Uh, let me go back to my points. He makes five points right here in this discussion starting at verse 21 to the king of Ammon. Let's see what they are. Uh, now, verse 21 through 23, his first point is to the king, God gave us this land. We didn't take it from, from Ammon. We were given this land by our God. So he said, the Lord God delivered Sihon and all the people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus, Israel gained possession of the land and took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So that region we just mapped out a minute ago, that block of land, God gave it to us. How do you know God gave it to you? Because when he fought against us, God delivered them, in, us in, uh, them into our hands. That's how I know God gave it to us. Now at the end of verse 23, so that now the Lord of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from, whom this people of, uh, from before this people of Israel, should you then possess it? When God gave it to us, are we supposed to give it to you? That's his question. All right, now let's go to verse 24. This is an interesting point. What's, what's his point? You tell me. What's his point at verse 24? Absolutely. Are you going to keep what your God gives you? You've got a God. This is a Moabite God, Chemosh. And so whatever Chemosh your God gives to you, are you going to keep it? Or are you going to give it up something else? If you think your God gave you that, are you going to keep it? It's a rhetorical question. Well, yeah, you're going to keep it. 
Shouldn't we keep what our God gave us? Makes sense, doesn't it? Here's his third point. When we came to Moab, what about Moab 25, verse 25? Did they? They made no claims. They didn't fight. They didn't, they didn't rebel. All right. Here's the fourth thing. This is also interesting. Why did you wait so long to claim this? If, if we did you wrong and we took the land from you, why have you waited all of this time? Um, approximately 300 years. Uh, according to, I believe, Classen's, uh, maybe it's Classen's chronology, maybe that mentions, I forgot where I got that, uh, reference. But if the conquest took about, it took place about 1450 BC, then uh, this is going to be, uh, uh, about 1150 BC. So that makes it, as the text says here, about 300 years. For 300 years, the text is wanting to mention 300 years. I knew that. I was trying to figure out where I got my 1450. I believe that was from Classen's, uh, chronology. But be that as it may, that was 300 years ago. Why are you waiting to now to say, stake your claim on that? And then the fifth thing is, verse 27 and 28, I've not sinned against you, but you have wronged me in fighting against me and made the Lord the judge render judgment this day between me and you. Now that's powerful. He started on the note, what, before we get in this fight, battle and fight, what have I done to you? Where, where have I wronged you? Well, y'all took the land. Okay. He makes these five points about the land. And by the way, it's not me that, uh, are you that, that, me that did you wrong, my nation, but you did us wrong. And may God judge between us as we fight. And we're about to fight. And unless you back off. And, um, verse 28 says they didn't back off. Now let's go to verse 29. Let's go back to our outline that we've been following. 29 to 33. Jephthah fought against Ammon and he won. Starting at verse 29. Um, what do you see 29 and, th well, let's go 29 through, uh, through verse 33. What happens in 29 to 33? Before, before the battle, actually. Okay, very good. Look at verse 31, that if you indeed, or verse 30, that if you indeed will deliver the, the, uh, the people of Ammon in my hand, then whatever comes out of my door uh, when I come back, I'm paraphrasing, when I return uh, in peace, then surely it will be the Lord's and I will offer it as a burnt offering. Uh, a lot of discussion among commentators. So let's take just a moment, and we don't have a lot of time because I want to finish the chapter and look at a couple of practical things here. Uh, a discussion here as to what really was this, this offer. And some, and I'll give you two or three different variations of that. And when I get through, I'm going to say I'm not sure. I have an idea, but I'm not sure which one of those happens. One writer suggests that the word and actually can mean or, and that he's actually saying, I think this is a little fetch, but that he could be saying that I will, uh, I will, uh, Surely, what, whatever comes, I will surely give it to the Lord, or I'll offer it as a sacri or offer a sacrifice. In other words, whatever comes out of the house, if it be an animal, it comes and greets me. I'll give it as a burnt offering. But if it's a human, then I'll dedicate it to the Lord, uh, and that He may be saying, I "I'll do one or the other." In other words, I'll dedicate it to the Lord. Another more likely consideration is the fact that. Uh, he is influenced by the heathen practices which involved human sacrifice and that he did ultimately, when she came back after two months, offer her as a human sacrifice. That's altogether possible. And that may be the explanation. There's another explanation of that, and that is that perhaps this was a spiritual sacrifice in the sense he dedicates her to the Lord and the sacrifice was that she is to be dedicated to the Lord in the sense that she can never marry. And what evidence can be cited of that? Well, I want to work through the rest of the chapter and quickly in a moment, but you've already read far enough to know this. 
There's never a direct statement that he killed her. Or that he had her killed. Maybe he did. Some think that's implied. She, when she bewailed, she did not bewail her impending death. The text doesn't say, but she bewailed her virginity. In other words, that she was going to be a virgin the rest of her life. Uh, that's what she bewailed with her friends. Now, when the vow was kept, when she came back, let's get ahead of ourselves to verse 39. The text says he carried out the vow which he had vowed. And the next statement says, she knew no man. In other words, she remained a virgin. You would expect the text to say, he killed her, sacrificed her and burned her. Now, she, he may have. I'm not saying she didn't. And if you're convinced, I think he put on a sacrifice and burned her. Fine. I, I'm not going to argue with you. It just doesn't say she did, that he did. It doesn't say that. It may imply that, but it doesn't say that. If it was a burnt offering, it would have to be done by a priest. And I'm not sure of a, pre, a, a, a legitimate priest that would have said, okay, I'll take her and I'll sacrifice her. That wouldn't be in harmony with the law. Um, the law would forbid human sacrifices. And there's no condemnation given here, and to my knowledge, unless I've missed it, of Jephthah doing anything wrong uh, in this, the vow he made. So I lean toward the, the idea that perhaps this was more of a sacrifice of her dedication to the Lord rather than his um, actually killing her. But whatever it was, it was taken serious. So let's go ahead at verse, I want to quickly get to the rest of this. 31, 32 and 33, he defeated the, the Ammonites. So he did his job as a judge. Now 34 through 40, he comes back home and the first thing that comes out is his daughter, as you know well know the story. And he cried out saying, what was his response when he saw her? Yes. I, I've been brought low and in a great deal of trouble. Uh, was he rash in making his vow? I think he was. I think he realizes that now. And But then he tells her, and she bewails her virginity. He, she has to go off for two months. She comes back, and as you know, uh, then she knew no man. And I think that's the explanation of what went on. Uh, what actually happened? I'll leave that to you to finally draw your conclusion. Uh, let's go to practical things because our time has gone that we learned from uh, this chapter. So let's see what those are. And uh, we don't have time for all of these. Um, Adversity, number five. Adversity makes us stronger. I think Jephthah going through the adversity, being kicked out by his brethren and going off into a foreign land, he came back a stronger man, didn't he? Physically, at least, at least as a leader, he came back stronger. Adversity can make you stronger. It seemed to do that in his case. But I'm more interested in this lesson right here. Uh, number six. Uh, God finally gets to the point, he's just let people go elsewhere for, for help since they have no use for him. And that's kind of the way Jephthah felt at first. You want me to come and lead you? I didn't think y'all wanted me. Uh, when somebody has no use for the Lord and then they come back and want the Lord, when they're in a pinch, the Lord's first reaction is, if you're not coming back genuinely, I don't, I don't have any use for helping you. I have no use for helping you. Number, uh, number eight, that it's funny how people turn to God and to man uh, when they didn't need the, those people before. They didn't have any use for Jephthah Get out of here. We don't have any need for you. Oh, we need a leader. Could you come back and be our leader? Now they have a need for him. Uh, Israel had no use for God. Oh, but wait a minute. We're, we're in trouble. Could, could you come back, God? We need you. Um, sometimes we're that way dealing with people. Had no use for you. Oh, by the way, you can be of some help to me. Come back, if you will. Um, funny how people act that way. What else do you learn from the chapters? Good point. He learned it somewhere, didn't he? Good point. We'll end on that note and chapters 12 and 13 next time.